Mehrat Torabi is here. He's a political commentator in our Tehran studios. Thank you very, very much again for uh, being here. Um, and as well as Mustafa Hoshchesh, a journalist and political commentator at our studio. Thank you very much for being here since the earlier hours of today. Uh, we are still speaking about, uh, you know, what keeps this day important within times and ages. And the fact that you mentioned, uh, you said that you found the examples of this, the, the, the fact that it has existed throughout different eras. What I uh, said before the break that we're going to talk about is that why is it that although we have numerous examples of the successful practice of resistance by Ansarullah, by Hezbollah, by people of Gaza like Mustafa just mentioned, the fact that resistance was the key that led to the victory of the Islamic Revolution in 1979. And of course, it was the resistance, this ideology, not the tanks and the weapons necessarily, that has contributed to the victory of Taliban, good or bad, in the country of Afghanistan today against an army of 300,000 that had planes, tanks, you name it. Uh, why is it? that the other party usually does not get it lessened, usually goes for larger weaponry instead of trying to examine the essence of what it, is it, what it is that resistance people do and observe that has enabled them to stand against this larger armies. Yes, Mehdi. Well, um, first of all, I think it's really difficult for them to understand our culture, to, mm. our, uh, to understand uh, Hussein alayhi salam Wait, uprising. Wait, is it on us? as media people, as Muslims, or is, is the blame on uh, Mustafa, you please think about this question as well. I really think it's important in today's world, media and everything, that maybe there should be a very good narrative. Maybe it's on us, you know, to define and redefine some of the things, not in a belligerent way, because resistance does not necessarily mean being belligerent or, you know, being warlike. Uh, this is an understanding that when you say resistance, a lot of the Westerners who are less familiar, they think it's a bunch of, I'm sorry to put it that way, mad people running around, you know, flashing their guns or shooting in the air. This is, this is not it. Maybe it's been us. Do you really think that it has been defined, redefined? Do you really think that maybe it's time that it needs to come out once again, not only by resistance groups, but by media people, by thinkers like yourself? Yes, Mehdi. Well, first of all, they don't want to listen, mm -hmm. okay? They are banning our media, okay? Mm -hmm. They have banned Press TV's domain, right? So they don't want to listen. Why? Because they have some imperialist interests that they pursue, you know, they have some hegemonic interest, some hegemonic agendas mm. that they want to pursue so they don't listen to what we say. That's one reason. The second reason is it's really difficult. You see, Islam and Hussein, alayhi salam, uprising covers every aspect of life. If you study about it, it's not enough. You have to come here and live at least for 10 or 20 years in Iran to understand what our revolution mm. means, mm. to understand what our culture, how our culture is intertwined with religion, with uh, the Hussein alayhi salam uprising. So that's the second one. And the uh, third one, as I mentioned, is that they actually want to eliminate this. They don't want to learn, okay? So they, they are doing, you know, this Islamophobia comes because uh, they know how, how powerful mm -hmm. this, uh, uh, you know, uh, the inspiration is, and they want to eliminate this inspiration, and that's why they propagate, uh, um, and uh, you know, propagate uh, Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. They, that's why they, all of their media are trying to, uh, you know, show that uh, they don't want to show the difference really between our real Islam and other versions mm -hmm. of Islam, like mm -hmm. American Islam or um, <coughs> um, other, uh, you know, deviant that has uh, other ideologies that are, that are deviant from Islam. So. Uh, that's, these are the reasons. Uh, one, imperialism. Second is uh, the difficulty that we should actually uh, try to use our, uh, all the tools that we have in order to communicate with the people around the world. And we if are there is a listening ear. Yes, you mean. yes, of course, if there is a But we still have to try. That's mm -hmm. important. And 
I think these, these two sure. uh, reasons. Mustafa, your turn for that. <coughs> Sorry. Um, ever since the fall of the Soviet Union, the U.S.-led West has picked Islam as the number one foe, enemy. And they've started misrepresenting Islam. When they were faced with the a much revered <coughs> and admired movement of uh, Imam Khomeini and Islamic Revolution, and the jihad, the true meaning of jihad, I would like to elaborate on that for foreigners, especially for those in Can the West Can you do later. that in, in less than 30 seconds? What is it you mean by jihad? Because that's a very controversial world in the, in the Western world, actually. Jihad, in real sense, as Quran, not just <coughs> Shi uh, Shiite Islam, but the Holy Quran represents, and the Prophet has taught us, is that once you come under threat, once you come under attack, you defend yourself hatta la takuna fitna until you defuse that threat. Sometimes you could fight it off to the border and that's done. Sometimes mm -hmm. you need to go beyond the border to push the enemy back to defuse the threat. Right. There are questions asking in Iran, why didn't it stop and accept 598 resolution after it can uh, the major port city of uh, Khuramshahr a couple of years after the war started Iraq started the war and Saddam Hussein was ready to do a ceasefire uh, and why did it take Iran for Iran to con I mean to agree to the terms of the ceasefire several more years hmm. well the answer exactly comes from this very Quranic notion that because if Iran agreed to the ceasefire then, then it was very much likely that Saddam Hussein renewed, restructured his army and renewed the attack and the war against Iran again and resumed the war. Right. So Iranians had no other way based on Quranic teachings that they have been learning all throughout ages <coughs> to, but to fight off the threat of Saddam Hussein until they make sure that there is no more threat. So. It's holy defense, but it doesn't mean pushing back enemy to the border. It doesn't mean defeating enemy altogether and annihilating it totally. No, it depends on the circumstances, on the enemy, as long as the threat is totally diffused. Now, let's get back to the scenes of Karbala. Mm. Imam Hussein was there. Some might think that he was there for ruling the Arab land, while once he saw that he was overpowered, outnumbered by enemy army, then he would give up the quest and express his allegiance, if, if that was the case. But what Imam Hussein did was exactly the interpretation of this holy verse of Quran, the Holy Quran, about jihad and mm -hmm. the true meaning of jihad. Um, he said, okay, if you don't want me to continue this journey to Kufa, okay, fine let me get back or go some other way but they didn't agree what does it mean first of all it means that he never initiated war that's the meaning of jihad that's the reality of Islam that he when when he said I want to revive the religion <coughs> of my grandfather he meant reviving these notions mm -hmm. that were strange only a few decades after uh, the, the uh, prophet of Islam many people ha had forgotten all about the reality of uh, you know these notions so and jihad in itself at the beginning does not mean killing people right it doesn't mean even initiating war sure. let alone killing people or right. maiming people first of all second but he didn't uh, surrender he said give me a path I want to avoid war I don't I'm not here for war I've been invited to this land but if you want me to express allegiance, to surrender, I would never do that because God uh, you know, uh, will be angry by that. Mm. It, it's against uh, the religion, it's against divi divinity, it's against divine teachings and my grandfather's teachings. So give me some other path. Distinguishing this very delicate difference is very important here that it's neither initiating war nor surrendering. Mm -hmm. It's you avoid <coughs> war, but if they impose war on you, you defend yourself to the end. Avoiding war doesn't mean surrendering to the enemy. 
So it's very important. If you, you know, come across the Iranian model of treating the United States, it's exactly the same. Look at Iranian policy towards Israel. Mm -hmm. Iran has never attacked Israel inside Israel, the occupied territories. Let's remember that. But as soon as it comes under some sabotage or terrorist attacks, it responds. Definitely, that's a tit for tat policy that works everywhere. But so it's very important to remember that when Iran approaches the United States, in, I mean, the confrontation with the United States, is, the model is exactly the same. The paradigm is the same. How come? The United States pushes sanctions, imposes sanctions against Iran. Iran doesn't surrender. Mm -hmm. Iran doesn't give up its cause, its, its sovereignty, right of sovereignty for making decisions about it, you know, developing its nuclear missile industries, or regional power. It would never relinquish its, honest, its, its honor and its sovereignty rights. And at the same time, when the U.S. tries to go for bullying demands, excessive demands, beyond the JCPOA, it never surrenders. But still, it asks the United States to stay loyal to the deal. It doesn't initiate war with the United States but if very, it's attacked, very logically, yes. very logically saying that, okay, I have done my part. Mm. I have lost my very precious uranium stockpiles. Now, you have to make up for that. Otherwise, I would go for war with you. Mm. Iran doesn't do that. There is a very soft line, a very narrow line between jihad, surrender, and attack and initiate war. Jihad means you don't initiate war, but you don't escape. You stay in there. Once you come under attack, you need to push him back as long as it takes to feel completely secure. And the Muslim community, your nation, should feel secure. That's, you know, that's been the origin of much of the Iranian and Islamic Republic decision-making and policies, mm -hmm. especially after the revolution. They all model on Karbala and Imam Hussein's way of life and decision making, especially in the last 60 days of his life. So this is the meaning of jihad. That was and of course, don't forget where we're talking about the, the, the story of Karbala. Uh, without a doubt. But the fact that, like I asked Mehdi, you know, the main question here is that although you have very successful models of resistance, uh -huh. You know, especially in our region, why is it that, you know, some people basically seem to not get their lesson? It's easy to tell that, you know, as long as you're equipped with that kind of ideology, then you're hard to beat. That's, that's not difficult to learn, really. Is it on us? Have we not really defined it well? Or, or where do you think the problem lies that we keep the, we see the repeat of, of history in different points in the Middle East, you know, mm. in under different names. Uh, uh, yeah, true. Uh, I forgot to continue about that. I was telling you that yes. when Imam Khomeini started this jihad with this specific notion and meaning that I just explained, then they depicted the uh, Islamic revolution and Islam as an arch enemy. So they started misrepresenting Islam, and especially the kind of Islam that was represented by Imam Khomeini. It was then that in one of his famous addresses, he said, we don't like the American Islam because Americans first started representing and forging Islam, actually representing the kind of American Islam <coughs> to the Muslim community, hoping that this kind of revolutionary understanding mm -hmm. uh, of Islam that has been inspired by Imam Hussein's school of thought would be given away, and, and Muslims would resort to this kind of Islam that's only good for morning and gatherings and not in the society, not in your political life. They liked secular Islam, the kind of Islam practiced in many other countries and in Iran before the revolution. So set the second move was showing a wrong picture, misrepresenting the reality of jihad and is Iran's revolutionary Islam. That's why they started many of these jihadi groups back in the 1980s mm -hmm. in order to misrepresent Islam. So like? the people in the West, most of them, yes. if they are not really looking for truth, their minds 
are preoccupied with these kind of forged pictures of Islam, mm -hmm. wrong pictures. For, this happened for political tribes. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, Muslim media outlets should do their best in Sampo, order to isn't represent. Isn't it interesting that people will rely on their respective medias for that picture? I mean, the, the blame is not really on people. The blame is not on, on people. people who control those media exactly. and, and, and their respective <laughs> governments. Why is it? Because they see the true picture, you know? They see the true picture and, you know, they don't learn or show that they do not want to learn, you know, where is the problem here? Yeah, they, they, they are channeled, you know, they, they, they're streamlined, they're, they're, the stream of their thinking, the, the way they think, it's been channeled by the U.S. ruled media outlets and empire. Um, with the arrival of social media, it's a little bit easier now to transfer the message, especially to the people inside the United States, hmm. With the, you know, when, when the corona outbreak happened, people in the West saw the reality of injustice in their communities. They sensed it, they feel it, and they are still feeling it. And they realized how, what we are talking about when we say that their knees are on uh, our necks. Mm. When they saw it in the streets uh, of the United States, they maybe, some of the black community uh, uh, understood what we say better a little mm. bit. But We're referring to uh, late George Floyd's up, case. Yeah, I, I don't want to take it long sure. because Miradin is in here and you want to talk to him as well. But let's talk about the reality of you know the Muslim groups practicing jihad and see the percentage of those who believe in this barbaric moves that are made by militant groups like Daesh, ISIS, and Jepat al-Nusra and people like them, and the rest of the Muslim community. Now, if you go ask people in the West, what is the uh, proportion, how, uh, how many of uh, these people are there in the Muslim community? They might believe that whoever believes in political Islam, no matter it's in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, wherever they are, most of them believe in bloodshed and mm -hmm. in ISIS way, while the reality is completely different. Once we exchange, I mean, this, this dialogue, mm. and you, you go ask Mehrad, and next question, maybe I'll have some time to explain exactly the origin of this kind of deviated version of Islam that is called jihadi Islam, why it's not jihad, and all of it roots back to the last three centuries. And it was started by the British mm -hmm. Empire in this region to fight the reality of Islam in pursuit of their political <laughs> goals. And it was reinvigorated after the outbreak, after the happening, actually, of the Islamic Revolution and its victory in Iran. They have been trying to reinvigorate this, kind, this school of thought in order to uh, you know, damage the credit of real jihad and real political Islam and revolutionary Islam that's defensive in nature. Take a look at the Iranian military equipment. Most of the Iranian missiles and mm -hmm. weapon systems are defensive. Mm -hmm. And if there is a 30% offensive missile, it's because everyone knows the first lesson in, in military <coughs> and war colleges all throughout the world, you need to strike an enemy, an invading enemy at home in order to deter his attack. Exactly. Otherwise, he would not pay any price. He would bomb you, you would defend. And it would take decades. And by the way, who has learned it better than the Iranians that they have seen the examples of what you just mentioned within the imposed war? Who has actually a better lesson in that than the Iranians? And uh, they basically have all the reason to develop that. We're talking about the examples of resistance. I want you to pinpoint that for us. Try to locate the different examples for those who are less familiar with this of how Iranians have employed that culture of resistance that they have inherited from their third Shia imam in their daily lives today, you know, we are not in the best of situations, let's be honest, but, but there are teachings for individuals as well as the governors uh, in order to keep the country, despite all the difficulties, 
on its track and try to resist that. That role that <coughs> of that learning in today's life as practiced both by individuals and the governors. Actually, I wanted to uh, mention, uh, I think, an important uh, um, element uh, related to jihad. Mm -hmm. Okay, so jihad doesn't always, uh, is not always related to, you know, defense and military and conflict and stuff like that. But jihad also finds greater uh, meaning in, uh, in Islamic Republic, in Iran. For instance, there are, let's say, places that need electricity, that need, you know, construction to help people. And jihad here means going there and helping these people without, you know, uh, expecting money, expecting any income. Okay, this is also called jihad, and we, we carry out this extensively in mm. our country, okay? So this is also important. This is also a kind of resistance, you know, against uh, difficulties. I wanted to mention this, and we carry out uh, jihad in all its forms, you know, in uh, military affairs and resisting against imperialist powers and uh, against those who have invaded countries, and we help also other nations who want to resist against mm. superpowers, other powers, uh, the Zionist regime, etc., the Saudi regime. And we also do this kind of jihad inside our home and also inside other countries. So this is the kind of jihad that we are going. This is the expression of all of those, you know, um, ideologies that we have inherited from the uprising of Hussein right. to help people, to build our society, nation building, and also stand firm, uh, stand firm against those oppressors and those who want to, you know, invade your country and have invaded your country. So Where is it in our daily lives, Mehrat, that we are showing that we have learned our lesson in resistance? Um, we have learned? Yes. So, so, yeah, okay, I'll tell you. Like, they assassinated uh, our General Hajj Qasim Soleimani, right? 40 million people came to the streets. It was huge. And this happened uh, during, you know, all the sanctions and propaganda that wanted to, you know, influence, pe uh, influence the people, you know. They impose sanctions so people get angry of their government. They, uh, uh, they propaganda is like, you know, artillery support for these, uh, for these sanctions. They, uh, they, they introduce uh, terrorists as journalists, mm -hmm. okay. So these are, uh, these are all uh, you know, offensive acts. And the fact that people come to the streets to defend their country, uh, to show that they support their country, is actually the, um, the expression of, the, of resistance. The, it really expresses, demonstrates how we resist. Sure. Um, I yeah. think this is, this yeah. is one great okay. example. Understandably. The example is Mustafa, uh, 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 where is it that we show that we have actually learned from the day of Karbala and, you know, our act, wha how we do our, how we conduct ourselves really justifies that we are, that we have actually done our homework, both, you know, in, in the level of governors and in the level of individuals. The most important, the most uh, difficult jihad is jihad of self, as God says, becoming a person and resistance. Don't forget that we have to mention that as well. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, becoming a person like Imam Hussein, that's the Jihad Akbar. That's the greater Jihad. Yes. The most difficult one. Um, you know, you have too many options available under cumbersome situations. Mm. You need to choose. Uh, you, n you need to do many sacrifices. And it's not just you. Your family depends on you, your relatives, your friends. And you should, you know, make very hard decisions at times. Yeah. And if you truly live with the lessons of Karbala, it helps you. But of course, it's very difficult. At the same time, in the society, there are too many lessons taken from Karbala, from justice, social justice, you know, uh, justice is present in every aspect. It should be present in every aspect. From medicine, I in the corona outbreak, mm -hmm. from vaccination, mm -hmm. to providing yeah. people, you know, beds at the hospital, 
and seeing no difference between the capital Tehran to Sistan Balchistan and you know far-fetched areas to other aspects to uh, sports facilities you know po welfare economy economic justice security justice justice which was best you know shown by the story by Imam Hussein in Karbala um, and the way he treated his followers and companions alike family members and those who were strangers but were his companions in his army and also all throughout his life and the lives of other Imams they are the lessons and we are on a journey we are never we have never claimed that we have the utopia mm. we are moving trying to move towards that utopia and we do believe Shiites believe that at the end of times maybe these years maybe uh, in the next decade a genuine offspring of Imam Hussein the 12th Imam would reappear in order to take humanity to that utopia we are on the road towards that destination and in every aspect of our lives we could learn from the story of Karbala it's not just fighting mm -hmm. as I said earlier the misrepresentation done by the West through their media outlets it has convinced people throughout the world especially those in the Western countries to grasp a wrong perception of Islam believing that or thinking wrongly that Islam is a belligerent religion while Christianity is friendship first of all all divine religions the Abrahamic religions they have similar notions identical message God has sent similar message to humanity but depending on conditions and the circumstances uh, uh, you know it has been accomplished it has gotten complete more complete that's why now people in the West as soon as you mention jihad they come to think that it's like Daesh killing butchering people in reality you know the Muslim world is divided into a Shiite minority a few hundred millions and the rest are Sunnis Sunnis are in three categories first four groups of Hanbali, Shafi'i, Maliki and Hanafi four groups second class is, are the Sufis or the people who follow Tariqat or the Sufis people all throughout the world I believe with a little knowledge of religion they know what Sufism mean they are around 40, 450 to 500 million people throughout the world all these groups they never believe that others are non-believers that we are the only party that's right that others should be killed none of them neither the Shiites nor all these groups of you know Sunni community the third which at best represent 10 to 15 percent of the Bahamis. Muslim communities Salafis. Salafis why are they called Salafis they all believe these Salafi groups they believe in the time of predecessors mm. the time of Salaf they they say that the first three centuries after the advent of Islam was the time when genuine Islam was in practice in Medina the city of the Prophet the first century by the Prophet and his companions a second century by the second generation and the third by the third generation these this era these three centuries are called the time of the predecessors and they all these Salafi groups claim all these Salaf groups that have been created only in the past three centuries they claim they know how to uh, you know revive that you know era and they believe that we are the ones that should revive Islam the way it was in the first three centuries mm -hmm. so we are fond of Salafism the time of the predecessors and they believe all others should be killed mm -hmm. even not all Salafi <laughs> groups believe that all others they they are in f uh, six you know uh, uh, groups 
or, or uh, large ones, or uh, uh, schools actually, I could say, they started 300 years ago with Wahhabism, as mm -hmm. you just mentioned. There are two world countries that are Wahhabi Muslims mostly. One is Qatar, the other one is Saudi Arabia. The one that's more extremist is uh, you know, the kind of Wahhabi uh, school of thought preached in Saudi Arabia. They teach identical lessons with the, uh, you know, at their religious schools. Uh, that, that Daesh preached in Syria and Iraq, they taught the same lessons to schools, Islamic schools in Pakistan, mm -hmm. where Al-Qaeda and groups of Taliban were studying then. So 300 years ago, Wahhabism, the first group started. Then Div Bandi started. Div Bandi, we don't, we, you don't hear from them nowadays anything, you know. Uh, but they, they are not political much, and they don't believe in killing others, really, and the, you don't hear from them nowadays. Th uh, and they were born around 290 years ago, a little after Wahhabism. But the l next four are the most controversial groups. In 1928, less than 100 years ago, Muslim Brotherhood started, mm -hmm. mainly in Egypt, but they are all throughout the Middle East, in Turkey, in Qatar, everywhere, but mostly in Egypt. Then a second group was Jihadi Qutbi. The name Jihadi, you know, it deceives many people who do not know Islam. Absolutely. They don't know that it's Sunni Islam in many categories, one small part in 1980 started under this title, Jihadi Qut. In 1998, Al-Qaeda, the mm -hmm. next group, and the last one, Takfirism, mm -hmm. which means all others, except for us, all others are non-believers and they deserve death. In 2003, they started. All these four, last four groups, they started for political drives. So it was first a political motive, then ideology was attached mm -hmm. in some, one way or another. They're different from Div Bandi, which is an, uh, you know, the second group uh, that started in the Salafism or Salafi school. Because in Div Bandi, they, they had an ideology. They were not after political motives. Little by little, they developed some kind of political you know, school. But in these four, Muslim Brotherhood, Qutbi Jihad, Al-Qaeda, and Takfirism, all of them were after political drives and later in order to absorb people, attract you know, the youth from across the world, especially those who have just embraced Islam and do not know much about who Islam. Who benefits from that? They, they absorb them and attract them and they develop some kind of ideology. And to wrap it up before I answer your, your question, they believe all these groups, even they mm -hmm. takfir each other. They, they condemn each other as non-believers. Exactly. The, the, you know, Daesh says that Al-Qaeda is a non-believer. They should get killed. And the same is true with regard to others. They have two beliefs. One, we are the chosen ones. Like the, some part of Judaism and, and Zionism who believe that they are the chosen tribe. That's why you find links between these groups of Salafis, the Wahhabis and others who have been started by the British Empire actually mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in pursuit of political goals for the, you know, for the UK. They find some similarities with Judaism in, exactly in these parts that they believe they are the chosen tribe. They mm -hmm. are the chosen people. All others should serve them. All others are non-believers. All others should be killed if they do not obey you. And a second belief that all, they have all in common is the, this uh, fact that we are the chosen ones for establishing a caliphate. Right. We want to establish a caliphate. All others should serve us. So they are small groups. And if you reduce that 500 million people of Div Bandi, as you would see, no more than 10% believe in you know, all these six groups that have such been developed in, in the, yeah, such 
wild ideology. Yes. The rest of the Muslim community, we are speaking PCD. about billions of people. Right. They are peaceful people. Mm -hmm. the, the meaning of jihad to them is, is if different. you attack them, they respond. Otherwise, they do not attack you. But ironically, the cameras of the Western media, not necessarily the Western media, of the media of the world, and the microphone is in front of that 10% right. who brand themselves as jihadi. And uh, nevertheless, people of the world see those people and you know, they think you know, that's what it means to resist. That's what it means to put up a good fight and, and jihad. My question to you, Mehrad, why is that? You know, isn't that interesting that as Mustafa just mentioned, it's less than 10% of all the ideologies in Islam, less than 10%, and they get the most attention and uh, and uh, of course thus they are judged and that judgment forms the basis of a lot of thoughts that uh, non-muslims have about muslims and you know at the end of the day who really benefits from that right um, basically powers who want to dominate the world should find a way you know should find a way to infiltrate and should find a way to remove the powerful walls the powerful uh, firewalls that exist in front of them. And our jihad or our resistance, uh, our inspiration from Hussein alayhi salam is that firewall and mm -hmm. they want to go through it. Okay, so wh what should they do? They should, uh, they, propag they you know, spread propaganda, not just propaganda, but also they have control over the minds of their own people, you know, to represent this firewall is something bad, as something violent. No, it's not violent. It's, uh, I mean, defense is, is uh, a normal phenomenon, okay? Mm. One country is uh, offensive, one country invades, one country defends itself. And uh, so this, they understand how powerful this is, they realize. And they want to, through propaganda, through other tools, they want to remove it, eliminate it. What is it to and gain for them? So, basically, if they remove this, they can expand their hegemony. They can, mm -hmm. you know, infiltrate in, in other countries. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the reason. So, they represent this, they present a, a, our resistance as something violent. And how they represent, they take the name of Islam, mm -hmm. and they take also the, the name, name of Jihad. Jihad, or, and, yes. yes, from these takfiri terrorists. And they represented both of these as the same thing. Mm -hmm. But we should remember mm -hmm. that the we do know that Mehrad, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's right. it's it's them who has right. to, and it's right. us who has to keep repeating that and right. try to portray a good, not a good picture, a real picture. We don't right. want to really sh sugarcoat anything, right. you know, right. and and say this is us. You know, you have to show the realities. Thank you very much and, for and that. Just one point, sure, I, I go want ahead. to mention. That the very fact that it was uh, the Islamic Republic and you know the resistance movement throughout the region that defeated these takfiri, mm -hmm. it proves that we are very different. We, we are in sharp contrast with, with, uh, you know, even even the meaning of of the words, even the language they use. Mm -hmm. That's the important. And thing. even the employment of resistance by countries like ours right. has been different you know both in terminology both in definition right. as well as practice you know that's right. something else that you know uh, has to be mm, pinpointed thank you very much Mehrat, for uh, that explanation we're uh, uh, trying to give you fresh images uh, if uh, my colleagues can give us fresh images from different cities